Hello everyone, welcome back to lecture 27. So, in this uh, uh, lecture, we will have a look at something called uh, single molecule manipulation. So, you recollect that in the previous lecture, we had looked at the atom manipulation on surface. So at that time, I have told that we will create these kind of atomic uh, lattice on the surface using manipulation. And by basically just creating atom or not adding an atom there. So, you can basically also create something known as an atom ROM or an information bit based on, on atom. But the problem, although the pr promise is interesting, so yes, you have already seen the, the number of bits that you can collect within the uh, centimeter square space is very, very large compared to a typical modern Blu-ray disc. The problem is actually to stabilize these atoms on surface. I already told you in all the examples that we have talked about or discussed, uh, mainly the problem was actually that the imaging was done at very low temperature. The, the, the issue is as soon as you increase the temperature, these atoms start to move around. That means although it is a promising application, maybe in the future it is going to be interesting or there are people thinking of uh, creating atom in a slightly different way that is going to be another prospe perspective which I am not planning to, to go into detail. But, the, but in any case, low temperature is somewhat seemingly sufficient and uh, uh, mandatory at the moment. Therefore, people thought we can also use something called molecules as, a, uh, as an information bit or we can, if we can try to manipulate molecular electronic structure, we could also basically use them as some kind of an information bit because they can still be operated at room temperature because you cannot imagine having uh, an atom row um, operating at 4 Kelvin. So, this is practically impossible, right? Um, well, in the future, no, nobody knows what is going to come up, but still uh, at the moment, it is not seemingly a feasible technology, but this is something in prospect one can think about. Therefore, people thought about molecular machines or molecular information bits. So, the example that I am going to talk about today is actually tiny molecules that actually can change their shape or conformations and depending on the conformation, we can basically think about possible applications based on these molecular um, molecules on the surface. Yeah? So, that is also something like an interesting aspect um, or prospect about surface science itself when you deposit these kind of molecules on surface. Yeah? There is also uh, molecular machines uh, also known, uh, known right now, there they also can do some kind of work and you can also basically just uh, make them operate uh, in, a, in a way you want. So, that is also was one of the Nobel Prize winning uh, discovery in the last couple of years before this was actually one uh, major. Uh, um, discovery and they actually won the Nobel Prize for that. But I am just going to put it in a slightly different perspective which is actually using molecules in kind of uh, um, as a molecular memory. So, what do you have here? You have here a thylacinin molecule, but the difference here is that you have a different type of metal. So, that is also something interesting about thylacinin in general that you can actually just put many different type of metal atom in the middle and their electronic structure actually changes. So, that is also the reason why people uh, consider or people use this uh, thylocyanins a lot in application. So, here tin is the case, but now when you put the tin in the middle, so the problem is that the tin, the, the radius or the ionic radius of tin is much more than cobalt or iron or those examples what we have seen in the previous case, there the molecules still remain like planar, but here in this case, the atom, the tin atom is a bit protruded out of the plane of the molecule. So, that means when the molecule adsorbs on the surface, you have two possibilities. So, you have actually a possibility of having tin up or you have a possibility of having tin down with respect to the surface. Yeah. Well, what is so exciting about this? So, that is the question. Well, these are two 
independent configurations of the molecule or conformation of the molecule with respect to the surface. Yeah? In gas phase, it does not matter or in solution, it does not matter because they will be identical. But on surface, you clearly see that the adsorption energy will be different. Yeah? Uh, you also see that the geometry is different because in one case it is like this, in the other case it is like this. So, that is the difference. And at the same time, the metal is also pointing in one case towards the uh, surface and the other is actually upward. So, that means chemical interaction between the molecule to the surface as well as their geometry is different on the surface. So, that is why we have basically two different type of adsorption on the surface. Now, what is so interesting about this? What can we do with this? Well, now something interesting we can do using STM. So, this is actually the molecule with the tin pointing upward and this is actually the molecule with tin pointing down. Yeah. So, now the interesting thing is that the of obviously as you would expect that the tin pointing upward where the molecule uh, is having a bright protrusion at the center. So, that is actually due to the fact that the tin is pointing upward. And in the other case, you see that the center is actually appearing rather dark that is due to the fact that the tin is down. Now, what is something very spectacular is that you can actually position your tip on top of this tin atom and apply a voltage like 2.5 volt. So, you apply a voltage and then what happens is a tin atom moves downward. Yeah? And then you can again go on to the molecule which is actually the tin atom uh, pointing down. You, you again stay with your tip there on top of that molecule and apply a bias. Then what happens? The tin basically comes upward. That is what is shown by this double headed arrow. That means you can basically using the STM tip push the tin down and take the tin backward. So, that is something like a switch. Yeah? That is why it is actually called as a switch and why it is also switch in the context here is that you are basically switching from one conformation to another conformation. Yeah? Well, I told you these conformations are absolutely identical in, in solution or in gas phase, but on surface they are very, very different because you can also measure the di by dv spectrum that means the tunneling spectrum on this molecule and you will also see that their electronic structure is different because in one case the tin is directly interacting with the surface and the other not that actually causes them to have a strong difference in the electronic structure. Now, what you are seeing here is actually kind of a time lapse, a time a dependent current measurement by taking the molecule. So, you place your tip on top and then just apply the 2.5 volt between the tip and the molecule and then keep on measuring the current as a function of time. What you nicely see is that there is some kind of a telegraphic noise down, up, down, up and so on. What is actually happening is that while you are measuring, the tin atom is going downward, upward, downward, upward within the molecule. So, without changing anything within the framework of the molecule, the tin atom is going down, upward, down, upward and so on. Since the tin atom is moving down and up, there is a strong change in the current at the tunneling junction and that is what you are actually just measuring like that. So, ideally you would see some kind of a telegraphic noise that is looking like that, but this state is actually corresponding to something like a tin up state and the, this state is actually corresponding to something like a tin down state. Yeah? So, you, are, you can now control that is the interesting thing. You, you need to have a threshold voltage for that. If you have the threshold voltage, you can basically push the tin through the molecule downward and you can pick the tin backward and you can basically switch them up and down. Now, that is something very interesting. So, can we do something more interesting with that just than, than manipulating? Yes, we can. We can do something interesting. So, now what I have here is actually is an array of molecules. So, the molecule you should identify like this. So, this is basically a molecule. yeah. So, they are not very clear in this image, but each of this you can see the, a clearly a pattern. So, that is corresponding to a molecule. And now, what I am showing you here is just an array of four molecules. So, that means a cross section or, or just a section from this part is being moved here. yeah. And then, what I have right now is that all the molecule having the tin 
down. So, all the molecule, the tin is basically now uh, pointing downward in all the cases. Yeah? So, this is the first molecule, this is the second molecule, this is the third molecule and this is the fourth molecule and in all molecule, the tin is basically pointing down. So, that means it is an array of molecule where all the tin is down, we call it a zero because you also have seen in the current signal, the down is actually representing something like a lower current. So, that is why I am calling it as actually zero. Now, with the STM tip, I can actually just go to the center of a molecule. So, this particular molecule and I can basically just apply the voltage and the tin goes up, the current increases, therefore, I am calling it as one. Yeah. So, then I can actually start doing it in a systematic way and you see that I have basically just using this row of atom a uh, row of molecule, I have created a 0, 0, 0 or 0, 0, 0, 1 or 1, 0, 0, 1 information bit uh, in a way I want. Yeah? So, here I have actually just come to something like a, a completely uh, all upstate here, all the molecules are actually pointing upward, that means the tin is basically upward in this case uh, and then I can put them all back and here I have come back to something like all down state. It is clear and beautiful. So, you can clearly do this manipulation of tin upward and backward in a very systematic way and what you have done is basically you have created an, uh, an information array uh, with a molecule. So, what is so interesting about creating array of information with a molecule? The molecule is small. It is again uh, something in the order of a nanometer. So, that means it is again you can pack more information in a smaller space compared to the current technology that you are using. That would mean that if you would ever use something called a molecular binary array, you can basically store more information inside. And of course, the switchability is also very, very high. The speed of switching is actually in the order of um, picoseconds. Uh, you do not even measure this here. You can basically just measure them systematically and you can also uh, nicely create these kind of arrays. So, this is uh, something spectacular that you can do. So, that is actually a bit in, in the future. You may also be using something called uh, molecular computers where each information bit is actually substituted by a molecule itself yeah, than, than what you are using currently is a transistor. Now, I will show you one more interesting example. So, of course, you can uh, create now there is a, a huge um, amount of research which is going on in this field where people try to create these kind of information bits and hoping that one can actually use molecule as one day uh, in information storage and things like that. So, I just want to show you a slightly different example. So, this is again a molecule which is actually called as a porphyrin molecule. So, this is similar to the thylocyanin molecule, a slight difference in the skeleton and the carbon skeleton. But now, uh, you can also see that the molecule is actually sketched here. So, it is not so important how exactly the molecule looking like. It is a fourfold symmetric molecule. And here, uh, in the background, what you are seeing is actually the image of a molecule. So, this is nothing but a single porphyrin molecule. And it is an iron porphyrin molecule. So, the iron porphyrin molecule, what you can do is you can dope with chlorine and you can create basically like a chlorinated iron porphyrin molecule. So, these green dots are corresponding to those molecules which are having actually a, a chlorine atom in the middle of the molecule. Now, I have here an array, a random array of molecules having no chlorine. So, this is actually something with no chlorine and this is the one with chlorine. Yeah, so, that is the interesting thing. Now, you can also see here in the schematic. So, I have basically here some molecule with chlorine. Yeah, so, this is basically chlorine and some other uh, with no chlorine basically. Yeah, so, there is no chlorine. Now, what I can do is I can take my STM tip, go close to the chlorine atom, switch the bias of the STM tip and then you can pick the chlorine atom from one molecule and you can actually put it to another molecule. So, that basically means I can easily now take these chlorine atoms from one place to another place. What is the advantage of that? That is exactly the same like we have talked about. I can basically use this again as an information array where chlorine atom containing uh, state will be 
kind of uh, uh, 1 and the non uh, non chlorinated state will be something like a 0 yeah i'll also uh, make you convinced that in the in the next slide so ideally you can do it uh, many many times so that's something very interesting you can do you see here again a sequence of images starting from 1 uh, till 10 for example you go like this and then here and then finally like this. So, you can basically see that I have actually manipulated chlorine atom in a very systematic way. So, you can notice this particular chlorine molecule with a chlorine atom. So, what I do I go on top of it I switch the voltage and then I pick the chlorine atom and then you can see now the contrast of that particular molecule change because the chlorine atom is now is on the tip. On the same molecule you can put the chlorine atom back and you can actually get the contrast back again. So, there's minor changes in between, but then again you can remove it, add it, remove it, add it or you can even move from one atom, uh, one molecule to another molecule and so on. So, there is enormous possibility. So, it is up to you what you want to manipulate and you can clearly go around and do this sequence of manipulation and you can clearly change the atoms from one molecule to another. Now, let us look at the electronic structure. So, when you look at the electronic structure, you would understand what is really uh, something we can do. Now, what is done here is actually again the di by dv. So, that means it is a tunneling spectrum. So, this is really the measurement STS and this is some kind of a, a theoretical calculation. So, this is a DFT based theoretical calculation. So, just for your understanding. So, now when I measure the spectrum on top of the chlorinated molecule, you see I have clearly this nice peaks here. Yeah? So, I am just calling it as 1, 2 and 3. So, these are the uh, uh, nothing but the homo, the homo minus 1, homo minus 2 and so on. So, that is nice. I have 3 peaks here. And on the right side, I have basically the LUMO and typically that is what I see within the window of my measurement. But now when you remove a chlorine atom and then you do again the measurement on that uh, molecule where you remove the chlorine atom, then you suddenly see that the electronic structure changes drastically and particularly this peak is missing now. Yeah, so, the peak which was actually we call it the HOMO of the uh, chlorinated porphyrin molecule is uh, simply missing and also there is one more peak here is missing and the only thing which is remaining here is actually the 2. I am just calling it as 2 prime. So, that is actually the one for the iron porphyrin. And on the uh, on the LUMO side you see it is more or less same, but there is tiny differences. So, what is exactly happening? So, we then basically just did some kind of uh, theoretical calculations to understand it and using theory you can kind of reproduce the same. So, when you look at the chlorine states, yeah. so this is of course something called a projected density of state that will give you a hint about how the density of state of the molecule is being contributed from the elements separately. So, if you look at the chlorine p state, so you clearly see that there is something here which I am calling it as 1 and here which I am calling it as 3. Now, the d state from iron is actually contributing to a peak here which let us call it as 3. So, now you see the correspondence 1, 2, 3 on the experiment and the 1, 2, 3 in the calculation. So, they are nicely uh, corresponding and as soon as you remove the chlorine from the iron then you would expect that these two peaks would vanish and then the only thing that would remain is basically 2 and that is exactly what you are seeing. So, this is something very spectacular. Now, you can also just see how the electronic structure of a molecule itself is building up depending on what you are actually just having on the molecule or not. So, it is like you know dissecting the molecular electronic structure. Yeah? That is a great possibility that you cannot do with any other technique uh, so far existing and you can only do with scanning tunneling microscopy. You can really dissect the molecule and you can look at the electronic structure. Now, coming back to the perspective, it is like you see the molecule that is having chlorine is having a very strong electronic state co uh, corresponding uh, to, the, to the chlorine states and, uh, and you also see that the homo lumo gap is actually much smaller than that actually of the uh, normal um, iron porphyrin molecule. So, this is also showing you that the electronic structure of the molecule is strongly changing depending on the state of the molecule whether having a chlorine or not having a chlorine and that is exactly why I told that again we can use 
this kind of array of molecule with chlorine and without chlorine as some kind of a molecular information array or the information bit for example where the chlorinated state will be called as 1 because it is a high conducting state and the non chlorinated state will be called as uh, 0 because it is actually a low conducting state. So, that is quite spectacular. So, you can basically use this kind of molecular array uh, in the future. It may be something that we would be using in our uh, computer. Yeah, good. So, you also see that there is something like uh, a strong difference in the magnetic property also of the molecule. Uh, the chlorinated one is some kind of a high spin state and the non-chlorinated one is a low spin state and that also means that we could also use it as a, uh, as a magnetic switch in order to store uh, information. Yeah? So, this is quite practical. So, that means in this kind of application what you would expect is basically that your STM tip is going to be some kind of a head that would write information and read information and then your surface with the molecules or atom array is going to be actually the, um, the component where you are going to store um, your information basically. Yeah? So, that is uh, the aspect of it. So, that is the, the way you have to see the application. But of course, there are a lot of limitations uh, from the point of view of doing this is actually what is limiting currently using them in any technology, but uh, uh, who knows that maybe in the future we are going to see uh, applications based on uh, these kind of systems. Good. Now, I want to switch a little bit to one more interesting application of um, tunneling uh, spectroscopy. This is actually the final thing that we are going to discuss with the tunneling spectroscopy. Uh, this is not very celebrated, but it can actually give you very powerful information about the interface and also the surface itself. Uh, but of course, technically it is very, very challenging to do this experiment and that is why it is not very commonly done. But tunneling spectroscopy is something very commonly done. So, what is this? This is called inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. What is so inelastic in it? So, now when we talk about the other spectroscopy where we always said that the electron that is tunneling from the tip to the surface or from surface to the uh, substrate to the, to the tip uh, in whichever way, you always showed that the electron is basically just staying at the same energy. Yeah? That means on the route, the electron is not losing its energy. So, that means wherever it started, it basically end up in the same level yeah? and then it finally just go into the bulk of the material. So, the energy of the electron was never lost while tunneling, but what if the electron the tunnel actually just uses its energy to do some kind of an excitation of the interface and then of course, it will lose some energy. So, that kind of thing could happen, then you can actually have something called an inelastic component inside the tunneling spectroscopy. Well, the percentage of inelastic uh, component is basically very, very, very less. It is even less than one percentage and that is the reason why this kind of a spectroscopy is extremely tough to do and therefore, not very much celebrated in the technicality. Yeah? Technically, it is very challenging, but otherwise you will see it is very powerful. So, now imagine a situation that I have some adsorbates molecules. Yeah? So, some adsorbate molecule that are sticking on the surface. And now, while the electron is tunneling through, if that electron energy is actually matching with some kind of excitation uh, that is present in the molecule, like a vibrational excitation or uh, a spin excitation or whatsoever, then what can happen is basically that the tunneling electron can lose their energy and therefore, you can have two components called the elastic component and the inelastic component. Well, if that is the case, then what will eventually happen is that when you do the tunneling spectroscopy, you will eventually measure something like both the components, the elastic and the inelastic components. So, generally, you would have expected that there is only elastic component, but that is not true. There is always a very, very small amount of inelastic uh, component. So, that means if the instrument is capable of measuring the change, then in the di by dv spectrum, you should basically able to see a kind of step like thing, 
which is indicating that it will be symmetric with respect to your zero voltage. Yeah? At both voltage, you should be basically able to see a kind of symmetric step and that symmetric step is basically representing the energy required. That means this particular amount is actually the energy required or the U inelastic uh, amount energy required to actually just do some excitation of the uh, of the interface, whatever is at the interface. So now let us look at a particular example. So this is a particular example. Here we have a carbon monoxide sticking on top of a metallic surface. So it is actually copper 111 surface. We have carbon monoxide sitting on the surface. Now when you place your uh, tip on top of the carbon monoxide and ramp a tunneling spectrum, then what you see is that there are clearly two steps here. So this is quite symmetric with respect to zero and there is another one which is also symmetric with respect to zero. So that actually happens somewhere at 35 milli electron volt and 4 milli electron volt. So what are they? So this is exactly how you are going to see the di by dv because you will see some kind of a very symmetric step like features. Then this turns out to be that these are actually some kind of vibrational excitation of the molecules that are actually present at the surface. So that means the tunneling electron while it tunnel it actually gives a part of its energy to the molecule and then the molecule basically start to do some vibration. So it actually excites some vibration of the molecule. So here in one case it is some kind of a vibration like this and the other case where the oxygen goes on other side and the carbon goes on the other side. So it is some kind of vibration like this. So this is of course a high energy vibration. So that is why it is at 35 milli electron volt and this is a, a low energy vibration 4 milli electron volt and you can basically identify them in the tunneling spectrum. So now well I can also do some kind of a mapping of this. So when I do the mapping what I clearly see is that if I would make an array of um, carbon monoxide on the surface. So it is about 513 carbon monoxide I have deposited on the surface and now when you basically just measure the tunneling spectrum of independent molecule what you find is that there are some molecules showing a slight difference between each other. Yeah? So then the question that you ask what is this difference So why should there be a slight difference between different carbon monoxide molecule. Well imagine that you have actually just created a carbon monoxide molecule with a 12 mass and another one with 13 mass then you would have actually just expected that there is a difference in the vibrational excitation energy that you require yeah? because it is a different kind of diatomic molecule with different mass. Yeah? You recollect that uh, from vibrational spectroscopy the frequency is strongly dependent on the mass of the atoms that is actually composed in the molecule. So therefore what you would expect is actually for C13 you would require lesser energy to excite uh, and for C12 oxygen you would require slightly higher energy to excite a particular vibration that is basically the vibration of the oxygen and carbon moving in this way. So if you map basically the di by dv image at a given voltage then you would find that some of the carbon monoxide atoms are looking brighter and some other are looking less brighter. Why is that? It is actually because the natural abundance of the C13 is about 1.1 percentage and if you count this is about 6 bright dots and that is basically representing an exactly 1.1 percentage of the C13 carbon. So that means when you actually deposit 513 carbon monoxide molecule on the surface you exactly have about 1.1 percent is actually just the C13 and that is why you see this. Yeah. So this is something interesting so I will also show you in the next lecture uh, a, a few more example uh, so that you can understand a, a little bit additional perspective of this. But here what we clearly see is that you can basically just measure some of the uh, vibrational excitation of a single molecule that is absorbed at the interface and you can even detect the, the isotope effect because you can clearly see that difference in the tunneling spectroscopy. Yeah? So with this I would like to conclude the lecture and I see you in the next lecture with probably one more example from this uh, and then we will try to conclude uh, the scanning uh, tunneling microscopy part. Thank you very much. Thank you.